Good evening, welcome. I'm Megan Rust, educator for interpretation here at the Frist Art Museum. Thank you all for coming out to tonight's program. We will begin with a land acknowledgement. The Frist Art Museum acknowledges and pays respect to the Cherokee and Shawnee native peoples and elders who call this land we are standing on their homeland. We also acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the ancestral land and water that supports us. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, Jatish Kalat, Return to Sender. We are honored and privileged to have Jatish Kalat here to present tonight's lecture. Return to Sender was organized by the Frist Art Museum. We are grateful to Sparone Westwater Gallery for their assistance. And thank you, Angela Westwater, for joining us this evening. Also thanks to the staff at Nature Mort and to Frist curator, Trinita Kennedy, for overseeing our presentation of this exhibition. Please take a moment to silent your, silence your cell phones as we gratefully acknowledge our sponsors. Silver Supporter, the Sandra Shatton Foundation. And as always, we are grateful for the continuing operating support from Metro Nashville Arts Commission, Tennessee Arts Commission, Commission and the National Endowment for the Arts. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jatish Kalat. Jatish is an internationally acclaimed multimedia artist and Mumbai native who produces installations, paintings, photographs, and sculptures. He has exhibited his work widely across the world in galleries, museums, and biennials, including at the National Gallery of Modern Art in New Delhi, who in 2017 presented a mid-career retrospective of his work, work titled Here After Here, 1992 through 2017, and at the, or sorry, at, excuse me, at the 2019 Venice Biennale, where a covering letter was shown in the India Pavilion. Please join me in welcoming Jajish Kalat. Thank you, Megan, for that uh, introduction. Um, uh, and thank you all for coming out this, uh, this evening under these unusual circumstances where there's such a global anxiety about stepping out anywhere, you know, and, and new protocols of how to shake hands <laughs> or shake feet. Um, uh, I want to thank the Frist Art Museum for um, for inviting me because this has been a very special moment for me. It's also really generated the possibility of sort of bringing to life a very nebulous idea which has now materialized as covering letter Terranum Nuncius upstairs. Um, I want to thank Mark Scala, Susan, Trinita, Hans, Scott, um, Buddy, you know, Amy, everyone I've been in conversation with over the last uh, several months. Um, what I'll try and do is, I won't try to be uh, really um, comprehensive in terms of speaking about my work. I would instead uh, focus on a few works, and I would also go back and forth in time, I think, quite a bit. So I hope that isn't too taxing to jump from 2018 to 2010 and 2005 thereon. But I'll try and indicate when I'm making those jumps at, from time to time. But to begin with, what I thought is I would share um, images from, uh, oh, I can do this, no? Yes. Images from this mid-career survey of my work um, uh, curated by Catherine David, who's the deputy director of Sandra Pompidou. And this exhibition took place at the National Gallery of Modern Art in Delhi and was spread across two buildings in, uh, two museum buildings, um, and covered roughly 25 years of my work. So all of these images would sort of play out in two or three minutes, but I thought that might be a good backdrop for me to just share. So there were two buildings. One was the one that was earlier. This was, and you know, there were two kinds of spaces. One of the buildings had these, you know, endless sort of corridors and rooms that followed one after the other. And it kind of allowed us to build a, an exhibition where essentially works were not organized chronologically or in terms of necessarily aligning in terms of mediums or material, but really to really look at these sight lines 
um, and see how works might talk to each other despite uh, gaps in time or differences in, in material forms. Um, it also allows me to sort of share a lot of works just as images while we speak of very few of these works later. So these, this is, for instance, almost 20 years old as a painting. This, what looks like a bamboo scaffold, was actually a sculpture. It's completely handmade, appears like a scaffold, and appears in different parts of the museum. Collectively, it's a single installation called Circa from 2010. These are works from art school days. These are from 1992, go back a very long time. And as these kind of corridors kind of come to an end, uh, the exhibition then continues in the other building. It's a work from 1998. But in the other building, it was actually a single work which opened like a labyrinth, a photo piece called Epilogue uh, that you walk through to access the rest of the exhibition. which then gets me back to our current exhibition in a way. Um, um, so the exhibition itself, titled Return to Sender, has two works, as you just saw. Um, it's got this piece called Covering Letter, Terranum Nuncius, and a work, its own predecessor, called Covering Letter, for, which was made seven years prior to uh, co the Covering Letter that you kind of enter in. Um, the work has three elements to it. Uh, or four elements to it, and one begins by actually seeing this sort of diagram, a kind of a map. And the map itself um, is a kind of return address, a kind of indication of where we are located in our own immediate cosmic geography. Every element that you saw within covering letter Terranum Nuncius are sounds and images, which are currently in what we might describe as interstellar space you know, 13.5 billion miles away from us, um, outside the sort of governance of the sun, uh, and hurtling away from us at a speed of 17 kilometers per second. And they're likely to continue their journey uh, well beyond our extinction as species, our planet, and perhaps even the, the solar system. Uh, because in this vastness of empty space, this spacecraft called Voyager 1 and 2, which was, uh, which was dispatched by NASA uh, in 1977, also was accompanied by these two records called the Golden Records, uh, on which uh, are these images and sounds that become almost like an evidence and summary of our life on Earth, which may actually most likely outlive us. Uh, these were composed as a message to an extraterrestrial life um, by Carl Sagan and Frank Drake, um, and to me, these images and the sounds, the sounds that you hear, are essentially salutations in 55 languages. So the, the piece kind of unfold as a normal letter. There's a return address, which is this image on the, on the left. And then there are the sounds that kind of bathe the rest of the installation, percolating the rest of the space. These 55 messages are also, as I said, all on the golden record, which is what you then move to into the other space and you access the round table with 116 images. Um, these 116 images are not exactly the images, while they form the exact archive, they were not exactly the images which were uploaded because in 1977, there wasn't that kind of computing capacity to upload that many images. So these were encrypted as sound files and uploaded in a, with indications of how one might decode them. So a, a very smart spacefaring species that could intercept a spacecraft at the speed should obviously be smart enough to find us in those sounds, was the assumption made. 
And I am eternally grateful to Ron Barry, a California-based programmer who actually downloaded the images from the sounds and was kind enough to allow me to then work with those images to realize the piece. Uh, this, um, this archive, in a sense, as you see them, are now black and white. Many of them were color pictures. They've lost data in this movement from image to sound to image. Um, the address itself, to me, is of, of a specific interest, partly because it actually points to our own sense of uncertainty and incertitude in the world. Uh, this diagram was meant to indicate to an alien that might find this message how to find us. Um, the, there were 14 pulsars that were identified as good indicators, stable indicators of our cosmic you know, location for at least a million years. Uh, but since 1977, we know that there are not 14 pulsars, but a billion pulsars in our neighborhood. So no species are going to find us on the address that we provided. Uh, but so we moved into the exhibition through these elements. And there's a fourth element, which is really the bench, uh, which sits under the, uh, the, 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 the horn speakers. The bench itself kind of points to a much more complex question. It just has a very simple shift in form. Uh, the bench, uh, which some of you may have missed, perhaps, in the darkness of the space, um, is shaped like the hands of the doomsday clock. And the doomsday clock is this peculiar instrument that scientists have used to kind of warn our world about the impending dangers and the likely apocalypse that we are kind of moving towards. In 1946, uh, since the Los Alamos um, project, Manhattan Project, when the first bomb was produced, uh, the scientists, some of the sort of giants of 20th century physics, made an announcement through what was called the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, announcing that it's seven minutes to midnight. And typically, you know, scientists are meant to make lab-tested claims which are falsifiable, but in this instance, the scientists almost behave like artists, making a very symbolic claim that it's seven minutes to midnight. When asked why was it seven minutes, they said that's a degree of anxiety. But taking those seven minutes as a, as a fixed number, every year they've reset the clock. And as of 2018 and 19, while I was actually making the work, it was at two minutes to midnight. And that becomes the only seating point within the installation, which as you move. Um, The table itself takes this kind of orbital form on which the, the images then sort of uh, appear and sort of disappear into darkness uh, from time to time. It's almost like a slowly breathing sort of table. You know, at the heart of this work in some ways was a point that actually Marx spoke of this morning. We live in a very highly divided world more and more where progressively the left can't speak to right or Republicans can't speak to Democrats, and there's an absence of vocabulary across an aisle of difference. And to me, really, at the heart of covering letter was this question that, you know, when we think of the other, we obviously build this image of the other based on a sedimented sense of what the other seems to be in relationship to oneself. But what happens when this other is so unknown and afar that none of those coordinates work? in space, time, and type. What happens when this other is so unknown? What does it do to the sender of this message? Do we then arrive at a sort of singular planetary um, image of ourselves as a collective sender? In some ways, that was a kind of question that propelled, I think, uh, my making of this work. These are some of the details. The works actually have some sense of depth as you see them, which, of course, the images don't reveal. There are a wide array of images. This then brings us to Covering Letter. And covering Letter was made seven years prior to this, this piece. Um, but I think at the heart of both these works are really this epistolary mode, the letter, the mode of correspondence, the mode of a return, a, a, a sender-recipient relationship, within which I think there is some space for us to think about the world. And in this instance, really, when you walk in, it's a, it's a dark room. You see a shaft of light and with words that flow on the ground. 
you also see words slowly rise um, in the in the in this descending film of mist you see ascending words um, it's only when the letter begins to move at some point that you realize that the um, author of the le letter i don't know how to do this let's see if it works yes the author of the letter was gandhi and the intended recipient was adolf hitler um, when you survey the date you realize that it's written 5 weeks before the onset of the second world war and you also find certain words such as dear friend is how the letter begins it also ends with the word your sincere friend so the word friend is the only word that appears more than once in the letter and thus it's somehow in this sort of parentheses of this these two words holding together the rest of this letter is how you read it and anyone walking in of course reads the letter in first person so it reaches out to you the reader in first person asking you what you might three think in terms of the way you might conduct your life because it's all written in first person um of course there's the historical dimension to the letter but i'm also equally interested in the fact that as you uh, read the letter you also have this possibility to move through the letter and when one does so i think in some ways you occupy at least momentarily this this long corridor of what this letter kind of holds in terms of a human possibility a letter going from one of the most you know brutal sort of one of the most uh, brutal perpetrators of violence receiving a letter from one of the most uh, you know well known proponents of peace both cohabiting the planet at that at that same moment in time um but um, both these works are in a sense descendants of a lineage in my work where i would return to a historic utterance as a way to kind of think about the present world so with the next work i'm actually jumping back something like 17 years so it's a piece called uh, public notice and public notice um was essentially a speech delivered um at the midnight of indian independence um a speech delivered at the time of the formations of the nations but also at the time when uh, you saw the partition between india and pakistan um i made this work around the time when india saw one of the most um at least in my own lifetime the most sort of you know brutal sort of sectarian riots um in the western state of gujarat and you also saw how the present can somehow begin sort of unearth the past as during this riots really the wounds of partitions were being replayed and reenacted in some ways and to me it was important to kind of look at something that one can read to make sense of this time and i began to go back to sort of utterances at the time of indian independence and one of the texts that i kind of settled on in a way to kind of clerically rewrite was the speech delivered at the midnight of independence so the speech is kind of hand rendered on on mirrors with an inflammable fluid um and i would set each alphabet a flame and as each alphabet gets kind of almost cremated um it collectively warps the letter the mirror and thus perennially kind of distorts this the present moment in those words and as you get closer to the letter you might even see your own reflection four times around every alphabet um i am actually not discussing several of the intervening works so there's actually other works that lead one to the other i'm making these long jumps really from public notice to public notice 2 which was four years later but uh, in a in a way to kind of stay within the rhythm of what led to the covering letters but um covering uh, public notice 2 uh, was again a speech act that then goes on to become a textual work kind of materialized as as form as cultural elements um when you walk into the room of course you don't get a sense of what these forms sitting on these shelves might be it's only when you step closer that you realize that every alphabet almost sits on these shelves like like fossils and collectively they become a speech that mahatma gandhi had delivered before he broke this very brutal i mean act called the salt act which denied every indian the right to make salt having announced that he's going to break the act he assumed that he could be arrested or assassinated and either situation would have left to led to some kind of violence 
So anticipating this kind of violence, he delivers a speech calling for complete civil disobedience, but with complete restraint, uh, total peace with total non-cooperation at the same time. And it seemed like the opposite of much of the kind of, you know, oxymoronic calls that we hear today in our public domain, you know. Uh, war on terror is nothing but further terror on terror, because war is terror. And you see this in all nations played out in different ways. And to me, just, you know, the speech was kind of like a powerful instrument to kind of rethink and reread a certain kind of a call um, at an at a extremely momentous, um, you know, historical sort of moment. Public notice two, another three years later, led to the third public notice. And in, a, in the time of a decade, they became almost like a trilogy. Um, once again, the third public notice two was really, um, um, at its heart, was essentially a speech. You know, the, that's the center of the work. It's a speech delivered on 9-11, but 1893, uh, 108 years before the attacks. Um, on the World Trade Center. Um, it's also an interesting moment that's been the reason for me to kind of gravitate towards the speech was also the fact that 9-11, 1893, 108 years before the attacks was also the first parliament of religions hosted by this very nation. Um, and it seemed like almost an act of premonition because this is before the world wars before battles were fought between nations, there was almost this premonition that perhaps the parliaments to organize would be uh, between religions, because that's where the conflict's gonna lead, in a way, that battles would be fought within nations um, on divisive grounds. And um, this speech um, was installed on the risers of the grand staircase of the Art Institute of Chicago. And when you say, come in from the Michigan Avenue, this is how you see the speech. It, um, these are static, but they are in the five colors. So there are 70,000 light bulbs that actually make the work. And they're kind of, the speech is refracted in these five colors that the US Homeland Security had marked as threat codes since 9-11-2001. So, you know, every day there would be a new threat level, as many of you would have seen. For a good 10 years, it remained a high, severe, high, severe, occasionally elevated, high, severe. It would keep going between the three. Um, and it never, in, I think in those 10 years, ever became either guarded or low. Um, interestingly, you know, somehow, by total coincidence, the exhibition had three extensions, so it ran for the whole year. And in that time, actually, the Obama administration had actually repealed this law, or this, this coding system. And you know, there was this little joke in the museum that you know, the artwork led to a change of policy because that was complete <laughs> coincidence. But, um, but so it's refracted in, these, in this threat coding system, but the speech itself calls for an end of fanaticism, fundamentalism, bigotry, intolerance. These were exactly the words in the speech, but almost every word that populated our public imaginations since 2001. 108, the number of years that separate the speech from the attacks, also in a lot of Asian wisdom traditions is an interesting number. It's the number of beads that you chant with when you chant on a rosary. It's a numerically very powerful number. Um, it's also astronomically an interesting number because 108 times the diameter of the Earth gets you to the, to the sun, and 108 times the diameter of the moon gets you to the Earth. So it kind of sits in a kind of interesting syzygy of sorts. Um, and to me, it was a powerful coincidence that to the hour, 108 years later, the speech was to be reread. Um, but the speech was not only delivered on the same sort of overlay of dates, it was also in the very site, because in 1893, the very edifice of the Art Institute of Chicago building was actually the auditorium where Vivekanand spoke. So uh, the, it's exactly the location where it was heard is where the, the work was installed. And being a kind of, uh, you know, uh, the grand staircase had an interesting structure. 
where it allowed me to kind of double the speech at the mid-level and the lower levels, but quadruple it on the four sides. So any path you would take through the museum, you'd actually encounter the exact same set of words. But if you do feel that you didn't read what's on the other side, you step back and you start rereading again, then you create an echo of the same words again. And I thought, in a way, through a kind of textual form, one could return the resonance and echo of those same words in that same building, you know, more than 100 years later. And also being an encyclopedic museum, it had these incredible sight lines that allowed for the work to be seen across these different corridors. Uh, and at this point, I'm taking one more leap. Um, but this time, I'm taking a leap not in time, but really in terms of this was made around the same time that I was, that, that Public Notice 3 was on view at the Art Inch of Chicago. This is what I was doing in the studio at the time. Uh, but it's a leap in terms of the different dimensions and questions that, that form my work in a way. There's a, um, uh, the work tends to take multiple forms and also tends to sort of inquire various aspects of my own um, life and being sort of parallelly. And I allow those contradictions to, to kind of proliferate. And, and I hope to make sense across longer time horizons uh, to see patterns across time. So the public notices only appeared like a trilogy to me at the end of 10 years, really. Um, so this is a work called Epilogue. Um, and Epilogue, of course, came about because of two other works I'd made, which I'm not sharing here. But essentially, it was some time standing in an exhibition that I had in London in 2010, in between two of my artworks, that I had this impulse to see every moon that my father may have seen. And Epilogue, in a way, unfolds as a kind of labyrinth. Um, these images that continue on and on. And, uh, and until they draw to a close. But actually, they form the 753 lunar months, or the 22,888, roughly the number of moons my father saw in his lifetime, from 2nd April 1936 to 2nd December 1998. And uh, of course, this is a work which was complicated for me, because I had no sense of whether it would mean anything to anyone else you know, when I made the work. Um, and so the first time it was exhibited, it was exhibited without any, uh, any text uh, that, in fact, defined what the work was about. But what was interesting was I realized also that most people were taking away narratives from this work that was beyond the scope of my own imagination in some ways. I mean, I recall this work was being packed off in the studio for an exhibition at the San Jose Museum. Phil Tinari, the curator, was in my studio, and he just picked a frame randomly, and he said, this is the night of... The, the Gulf War attack. And I thought he was joking, but you know, he picked it and he said, you know, this was a new moon night, and he actually pointed to the moon when the moon didn't exist, when the actual uh, Gulf War commenced. And to me, it just seemed like this was a completely unforeseen story, but emerged out of a narrative of my own father's lifetime as I had seen the work. So in a way, the work has been read, I think, through various lenses every time it's been seen, because every date, has a corresponding moon. But also, in the work, the moons are not actually lunar forms, but these are essentially progressively eaten rotis that become a gibbous or a crescent moon. An uneaten roti remains a full moon. And thus, they become cycles of meals, um, cycles of time, cycles of luminosity and darkness um, at the same time. So this. Um, until, of course, there's the last frame and the moon of 1st December 1998. But uh, when I had this large sort of survey, retrospective-like exhibition at the NGMA, there was the possibility once again for us to bring works that were separate from, by 10 years together. So for instance, when you come out of the labyrinth, this is an image I shared earlier, you come across a painting that you walk into. And this was a painting I made 10 years prior, so 20 years ago now, uh, 10 years prior to uh, making Epilogue. And at the time, I barely spoke about the work. But the title, 22,000 Sunsets, essentially came from the number of sunsets my father saw, roughly. And it took almost 10 years for uh, 22,000 Sunsets to become Epilogue. And to me, essentially, they're the same work, um, separated by n numerous years and uh, 
a mediumistic divide, you know. Uh, otherwise, pretty much the same work. But it's also 10 years later that a painting which was like 22,000 sunsets becomes this. So these are separate by about 10 years, you know. Um, so I was maybe, in a sense, just to put chronology in some order, you know, while Public Notice 3 was on view at the Art Institute of Chicago, this was what I was painting. I was making epilogue at the same time. These were images, actually, of a group of people at a, at a railway station, of course, not far from where my father used to board a train every day, but, um, but also there's, this was an announcement of a delayed departure and a picture in the newspaper with, this with an anxious look in everyone's face. But also a whole body of work of mine at that time in the mid-2000s were paintings essentially where a single figure would never be painted as a single figure, but would always be painted as you know, an inhabitant and habitat almost becoming one. And thus numerous stories would proliferate each portrait. And thus a coming together of multiple figures would become a proliferation of stories across the heads of the figures in some ways. Um, so I think one element that runs through my work is this, I think this need to repeatedly kind of uh, return the gaze in, in axes of vision which contradict each other. So if you look at the world at a horizontal level, we see a world full of stories. But if you look up or down, uh, those stories tend to become somewhat muted. And you see this acro across long arcs of time, you know, in terms of, and this shift in axis in space, but also movement across time, either going to the past or the future, somehow tend to sort of make me think of realigning one's vision of the present in some ways. And it's something we do every day, I think. When we look at an object, to see it more clearly, we take it close or far in space. You know, we think back and forth every day to reorient ourselves in the present day. And I think the work tends to do that across longer periods of history or longer axes of, of space shifts in some ways. So this video was also from 2010. Um, um, it was part of an exhibition called The Astronomy of the Subway in London in 2010. And I'm not playing the video, but the video almost appears like a journey through a NASA film. And the celestial bodies would slowly sort of move towards you. Um, the only giveaway in some ways about the work is really the title. It's called Forensic Trail of the Grand Banquet. And perhaps the word banquet somehow triggers certain recognitions of forms. But every element in this sort of cosmic field are x-rays of food. So these are, for instance, this is a cluster of sprouts. That's an Indian street snack called the bhajia. Uh, somebody might see a donut, you know. But it's essentially um, x-rays of food that then populate this dark, indeterminate space. Um, slices of corn. And it took four or five years before a work like Forensic Trail of the Grand Banquet became another work called Sightings. Uh, this is roughly around 2015. This is a photo piece called Sightings D9M4Y2015. And the title almost appears like a code or some kind of an astronomical notation of some kind of supernova explosions in a distant galaxy or some kind of cosmic imagery. But essentially, D9 M4 is 9th of April, Y2015 is 2015, the day of the month of the year when um, I photographed the apple, orange, papaya, pear, blueberry, plum, and fig. These are essentially seven fruits uh, that when you move in front of the image, they would sort of flip from being the colors of the fruit as we see it into its own sort of negative, into its own inverse. And in that shift, in that chromatic shift, they seem to sort of jump in terms of space and time. You know, something that's so close to us in our hand suddenly seems to reveal this kind of imagery. For instance, this is the surface of an orange. And as it begins to unveil its own negative, uh, somehow a whole other range of images seem to emerge from it. It's an image of a fig, a pear, three hemispheres of a single papaya fruit.
This was as sightings were displayed at uh, Speroni Westwater at my solo exhibition in 2018. And it's thrilling to have Angela here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, sightings kind of return to some of the things that we, you know, know. You know, we know that anything that's red in this room appears red to us because it's absorbing every other color from the spectrum. Um, for if color does exist, then anything that looks red should be the very opposite of red. Um, so in a way, we kind of inhabit a complete hallucination in terms of every color we see. What sightings do is they essentially just return one layer of hallucination back from our lived experience. And in that return of this chromatic inversion of what one could speculate could be the color, it seems to kind of shift from this image of the fruit to something that seemed like a forensic information of where the fruit perhaps came from. You know, we know we just need to go four steps backwards to think of photosynthesis and light and the sky, and then we are there at the stars, which then manifest as a fruit. If consumed at breakfast three days later, I can do a slight talk with that fruit. And thus, there's a whole flow of energy that, that one can sort of think about in some ways. These questions then led to sort of the making of the sightings. Let me see if this works. Yes, this is a very clumsy video, but that's the only thing I could find on my cell phone that kind of indicates what happens in the presence of the work. They kind of move between the color of the fruit and its opposite, dependent on where we're standing in relationship to the work. So we kind of determine how the work talks back to us in some ways. Oops. Um, so around the same time, um, I was making these drawings. And they kind of, I think, become part of a cluster of works which I think are asking the same questions but through different possible ways of asking that same question. You know, these were drawings I began to make in 2015, where essentially I make a line drawing while I'm in the studio. Um, and then I kind of step outdoors in the studio backyard, and I lay a kind of inflammable fluid one line at a time on each of these lines and set them aflame. And in a way, of course, we know wind moves and there's breeze, but you know, standing in the studio backyard, there's very little I can tell with my body of where the wind is actually coming from, and it's a very slight breeze. But even the slightest movement in the near atmosphere begins to talk to the drawing in some ways. The wind begins to bend the fire and leave an imprint of that line. And in some ways, the drawing by the time I complete the drawing, becomes in a way a kind of record of this, almost like a transcript of this conversation between wind and fire that I can barely hear or barely fathom. Um, and thus it also becomes a kind of record of the time of that drawing itself. These are again installation views from my exhibition in New York, where the wind studies uh, began to take other forms. Uh, so these are called wind study Hilbert curve, and they essentially come from a, a mathematical form devised by this German mathematician called David Hilbert in 1891 as a way to kind of have numerical correlates to space. And uh, while I don't know if this so for instance here, this is a single curve. When it drops on an order of magnitude, it goes down here. It doubles on its side, but when it quadruples, they turn direction. This whole cluster drops down here. It doubles on its side, but in the quadruple, they turn. The whole thing drops down here, doubling on the side. And thus, they become like a fractal-like drawing that simply descends orders of magnitude from small to large or large to big. And they become like a starting point for me to then make a wind study, to lay out a space-filling curve as an as a inherited drawing from a mathematician that then becomes a starting point to start, in a way, recording a kind of elemental flow in the presence of that drawing. 
So all of these are actually one single line that curls through the entire space of the drawing. They begin at one point, they end at the other point, uh, forming this fractal-like structure. Um, these are all parallel projects in a way, the sightings, the wind studies. Uh, this is a piece called um, The Infinite Episode. And The Infinite Episode, uh, when, and, and also for some of you who saw the exhibition in New York, you saw these works in juxtaposition. And I let them play off and talk to each other in some ways. Um, the Infinite Episode essentially has an image of 10 sleeping species. The only thing that happens in that state of sleep is that the species surrender scale. So a sleeping lion and a sleeping mouse or a sleeping turtle acquire the same scale of body in that state of sleep. And really, you know, return to these questions that, you know, where were all of us last night and where are we headed tonight? You know, do we surrender ourselves in one single cosmic dormitory? And in that state of sleep, do we have actually a scale of body? Do we have a sense of self? Can a sleeping lion and mouse cohabit the same patch of grass in the state of sleep? You know, if one awakens, of course, the other may not exist in some ways. These are elemental, again, kind of drawings that I call rain study, the hour of the day of the month of the season. And the rain study is to begin with masking out all areas of the paper except the area which would be exposed in some ways to the skies. So I would mask out every other area, step outdoors, and let the descending rain sort of settle on the paper and lay a very fast drying pigment and within moments, wipe it dry. But this very brief immersion of the drawing within the rain leaves this imprint which is almost like an astronomical form. Somehow this, this indulgence in a near atmosphere leaves this imprint which seems to be from another space and time. And, and in a way, it's some of these parallel drawings and explorations that actually direct the course of my thinking that then takes me to works like covering letter terra and amnancia. So they kind of play off each other through material practice of a certain kind that becomes archival practice of another kind that sort of talk to each other in some ways. The graph in the center is actually a hand-drawn graph with watercolor pencil. So it's actually when the, the, the drawing enters the rain, it's at that time that the droplet then sort of almost uh, unleashes the sort of dormant potential of the watercolor line, which is kind of aquarel pencil, and then creating this kind of constellations. I'll end with maybe two or three more works, and then I should be done. Um, so this is a video called The Eternal Gradient, and um, was once again conceived around the same time as the wind studies and the rain studies. Um, the Eternal Gradient is a large, ideally seen as a large projection. As you walk into the room, uh, it always appears like this. It always appears like a static image. But if one looks at it for a little while, the images may have moved. So here, of course, I'm jumping through the images so that I don't have to play the high-res file. But uh, they would move, transition very smoothly from being a crescent moon to a new moon. And within a couple of minutes, it would be a full moon again. Um, here, the entire image is essentially all the moons that make up any year. So it's 365 moons of any year. You know, as artists, we always have the desire to kind of, you know, we know we work with the relative, we know we work with a form, an image, or one might say a datum, you know, which would never get us to the infinite, which would never get us to the unknown. But in some ways, you try to create structures and games you set up for yourself, which can allow you to breach, in some ways, this, this territory which is inaccessible to you. And in some ways, the, 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 my indulgence in this idea was really the fact that you know, every year has an equal number of full moons and new moons. So I thought if these moons could transition through their entire cycles of fullness to fullness, darkness to darkness, then you would see an even gradient of darkness that would breach this gradient of light, and a kind of infinite flow would occur. But what was interesting for me was that finally when the video got completed, there was this realization that any moment in that video corresponds to an infinity of years gone by, 
an infinity of years yet to come when let's say 1st of Jan was a full moon. So if you moved into the video when 1st of Jan was a full moon, that corresponds to endless years gone by and endless years yet to come when 1st of Jan would be a full moon. So thus there's this stacking up of infinite correlations between these lunar cycles and corresponding years in some ways. I'll end with just two more works. Um, so this uh, is a piece that I'd exhibited at the last Kochi Biennial uh, 2018, um, um, an exhibition uh, where the curator had larger questions about alienation, our own sort of uh, sense of place in the world. And in some ways, uh, to me, the, the image that I kept getting drawn to was this form of a hand axe really one of those first examples of any species on our planet that, that reshapes another object. And in that reshaping of one object creates this expanded capacity and almost like a processes to the body that would then create the possibility for that species to alter another object and another object. And thereon create a cascade of a changing world until we come to a world where we begin to sort of contemplate our own extinction in some ways. So this work, um, when you walk into the room, you see what appears like enlarged hand axes, sculptures that appear like they're either held by a massive homunculus or perhaps by a, a species as large as the species, the largest species that ever lived. So there was this kind of revised geography that if we actually have this uncurtailed domination on every other species, then should we imagine ourselves as the largest that ever lived? And thus, I arrived at a fist size of about six feet, which was the size of these sculptures in some ways. So they sit on a plinth that looks kind of normal from one direction. And as one sort of moves, they begin to reveal a, a slightly altered shape. And this is the shape of the doomsday clock that I was just speaking about, that also carried into uh, the uh, the uh, covering letter Terranum Nuncius. And so in, in this work, in a way, this kind of dawn of human ingenuity sort of sits on a plinth that sort of points to another kind of, you know, reflection on the kind of state of the world um, announced in that year at the time that I was making this work at two minutes to midnight. As one steps closer to these sculptures, uh, it begins to reveal this kind of, almost like a fossil scape. But not a fossil of species, but fossils of eyes, of reptilian eyes, mammalian eyes, uh, fish eyes, all kind of looking back at us in some ways through this form of the, of the hand axe. I'll end with a painting well, this is, is reproduced very badly, given the scale of the work. The work is about 60 feet long, and uh, the image doesn't really do justice. But I thought I should share it anyways, because when I previewed covering letter Terranum Nuncius in, in Bombay, uh, this work was juxtaposed with covering letter Terranum Nuncius in a very large, voluminous space. Uh, two works that I was making at exactly the same time, where there are shared impulses, but there are completely divergent methodologies, divergent materials. Um, so ellipses really didn't begin as a single painting. They began as small puddles of abstraction that happened over several months, maybe 14 or 15 months. And at some point, I began to see that they were calling for some kind of coming together. And it's about eight months ago that I began to really think of all of these isolated panels as some kind of a single accordion-like uh, sketchbook unfolded at a certain scale. And it's almost as if one existing image and another painted across different durations of time began to birth a third image purely by their presence. And thus, it's a kind of series of speculative abstract forms that I think connect to a whole range of questions that I'm otherwise interested in, but through this non-language of abstraction in some ways, because it's not a sort of linguistic correlate. There's not an image correlate directly that, that I think of and I paint. But um, the whole painting, in a way, begins with 
uh, with a with a hand drawn graph so there are these graphs which are drawn with watercolor pencil so they are deeply unstable when i when they are drawn so at the point of making any mark it leaves other marks you know unforeseen but this itself become some kind of a pattern to direct the course of my next image the grid and the grid which is kind of smudged and smeared by the movement of one's own finger uh, then become a starting point to start thinking of an image and really you know it's something i should have probably learned in art school but you know over the years you come to a certain rather superficial conclusion that painting at its very fundamental level can be the story of hydration and dehydration that something that comes out of a can or a tube it goes through a certain degree of hydration and as it dehydrates it creates not just an image but in some ways a condition to the image depending on how that image might dry so for instance at the very edge you know they might become sort of ferrous or earth like or if water moves through them they might split this the material on the surface and create forms that you know for instance a river might take a thousand years to change course on planet earth but on the surface of a painting it can happen within 4 minutes and thus the surface of a painting becomes a little laboratory on which you can work out questions that are sort of long duration questions questions on evolution on entropy that you cannot necessarily ask with a sort of with i have no vocabulary for that and the painting sort of creates an environment in which some of those images can sort of play out I'll end with this last image. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I need to stay on for some questions. If there's any, but or otherwise, we can we can always try chat one on one. Okay. You know, in a way, it's it's eternal time because um, because it begins with any year, with the principle that every year would have an even distribution of darkness and light, an equal number of full moons and new moons. So, if you begin with any year, and then you create a fully corresponding cycle for every moon, you in a way inevitably arrive at something that gets you to the doorstep. of this question about something that points to the infinite it doesn't really point to the infinite just about gets you to the doorstep from where you can ask or you can raise a finger you know and to me that was really i think uh, that's what got me started but like i said you know there's this feeling that every moment in the video is flashing these corresponding years gone by when any year that that was a full moon first of jan would correspond to eons of years gone by and yet years yet to come it's looping and it loops in actually a very short duration it it plays out for just about 3 minutes but in those 3 minutes you actually and i had to sort of arrive at a certain time where it feels like it's static all the time and it only takes a distraction away from it to see that something has moved you know but if you keep looking at it you wouldn't see it change except that if you keep looking at one moon then you see it change but the whole thing as itself seems like a, a like a gradient is just the gradient keeps moving no. <laughs> yes you know yeah i think partly you know while it might seem esoteric if i said it came to me you know but uh, but yes i think one needs to sort of also let artwork self organize their own journeys you know so while there's a lot of processes that get involved and hans knows this more than anyone else about the many conversations in the realization of covering letter terrenum nuncius so the many definite decisions you make in terms of how illumination might get programmed etc but that said you know many of these things come to you kind of in a nebulous way in flashes uh, and then you kind of you want to see it more and more clearly um your ultimate clarity is only when you actually materialize it fully you know so for instance um say with covering letter the the old covering letter with gandhi's letter to hitler 
the work dates back to 2009 and as early as 2009 i had actually proposed it when i was invited to show public notice 2 which was gandhi's speech at the hall of nations in in the kennedy center in washington and at the time i had no idea how this could be realized it was just this nebulous form you know eventually i think the curators were right i think public public notice 2 was the absolute fit for the scale of the hall of nations with every flag in the world you know with with the with the work below uh, there wasn't darkness there either to to realize this work but it took 3 to 4 years thereafter for that image of a parallelly atomizing letter that a body can move through to become the artwork you know so i just i think i i kind of leave myself in a space where i'm kind of medium agnostic at the level of conception or thinking about uh, the world and then that becomes a insistent inquiry that if that insistent inquiry you know sustains itself <clears throat> might become a form you know but others just fade away you know I think, you know, I think I'm, I'm kind of drawn to think about how the past constantly reincarnates in the present in some ways. So, for instance, I mean, if we think of the particular speech that you are referring to, you know, the, uh, the which then became a public notice too, one could think of that particular speech as a very genesis of the civil rights movement in the United States, for instance, with Martin Luther King having returned to the repeatedly to the idea of uh, non-violent protest uh, referring so many times to gandhi in his own lifetime you know we've seen that with mandela nelson mandela we've seen that with obama making references to the speech so i think you know and this work was made in 2007 and you know any time i would hear a citation of this it almost feels like yes you know this is something we can again summon back to really think about the manner in which Uh, we might think of even difference for instance you know it needn't be uh, extremely violent or anything it can be just polite uh, um difference amongst people in terms of world views that you progressively see in today's world as it plays out in television channels or election campaigns have arrived at a world world views where the world views don't find overlapping vocabulary and i think you know if you really look at the letter for instance you know i mean just it's it's a long reach you know going from one end of human possibility to another um and to me uh, somehow you know uh, sort of revisiting them to reflect on them i think seems very valuable today mm -hmm. uh, and you sort of seek to bring them together and you also seek to bring back together the relationship between say um, you know as artists you know we are sort of you know some kind of map makers it's just that we are making maps of territories that we do not know and um, we're trying to draw out these amorphous maps you know um um so in a way i'm interested in how for instance if i have to draw a constellation Uh, can i then simply take my paper out point it to the sky and will a uh, passing turbulence in a near atmosphere render the sky for me you know and can i rely on this position that the paper takes you know not like this where i am going to draw into this you know which is one gesture of making a mark but there's another gesture of making a mark where i actually step outdoors and serve the paper into the skies and then take back an image and i'm interested in how certain actions can generate imagery um and 
in a way i also see that you know while my work connects to all of these disciplines i don't own a telescope you know <laughs> or i'm not uh, essentially you know in that sense directly i mean i was at the hayden planetarium a few days ago which i do visit or you know i turn up for other reasons you know like but not necessarily because of a direct interest in astronomy but really what does looking at the sky tell us about our world here does that change it even momentarily the stories we tell ourselves and hence to me this desire or this 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 well, i can't even say desire but the fact that eventually these works have happened to me in a sense that you know a series of sequences i simply jump from public notice 2 to public notice 3 but there are a lot of intervening works that direct me little by little by little to these coming together of these different constituencies of information you know one is information about the building the site the date and in a way that's also a kind of organizer kind of map making through through what can otherwise be fragments of information and i often ask myself where is the work located is it located in the illumination of the stairs is it located in the date is it located in the site is it located in the words and i don't know you know but yet when they all come together is perhaps what we think of as the work and that is uh, in some ways uh, the 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 action of you know one might say the action of a semionaut you know <laughs> trying to make you know trying to journey through science you know and making sense of the world <laughs> not a journey of an astronaut <laughs> but <laughs> but a semionaut <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. Bad ideas proliferate all the time, you know. The the complexity is finding any good ideas there are in them, you know. <laughs> yeah, yes. You know, but also ideas that I sort of at least for them that have served me well in terms of propagating a question from one to the other were also not in this in this set of slides because you know I just um You know, schizophrenia is a complex word, so I wouldn't use it loosely. But I think you know, there's a there's a dimension of schizophrenia that I think exists in the work. It's progressively I don't resist it; I just let it play out because I've now over the years seen that each of these works have had patterns of four or five years before. You can see even six of them together, and I just I'm just letting it flow as it goes. So. you know and and i think you know to make sense of the world i think one needs to really think across multiple registers in some ways so you know a bit like if all the fingers on our hands were the same dimensions we'd probably be able to hold nothing you know <laughs> and if they were all arranged in a linear order and i think it's just this strangeness of the structure of a hand that makes it possible to do a number of things with it and i've sort of submitted to the fact that maybe that's the reason these works go in different directions to help me see, make some sense of the world some ways which is nice to hear <laughs> yeah. at any given point you know it, it isn't really clear for instance i mean i wasn't sure when another covering letter might happen or would ever another public notice well there are numerous speech acts that actually sit on my desk um, of have been for, for, for many, few years now they never never become anything in these years so it's now been 10 years since public notice three so you know, whenever that happens Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>